you are for a while. It's so unpleasant. I hope it's more fun here than it is in my... When did you start? Okay. You didn't plan, right? No. Awesome. Yeah, and then classics takes care of some archaeology and that kind of thing. Right. Well, especially because you're going to have... Are you going to still teach a little bit? Yeah, I with your normal load. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's cool. Yeah. And then they also run the Digital Humanities Initiative. That's the other. That's the other. Like, and the Material Collective stuff too. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. I'm Jennifer. You look vaguely familiar. I wonder if you went to some like Delaware Valley Medieval Association stuff. How long have you? Because I was I did a postdoc at Penn in nine ten. Would you have been? Okay, so you might have been. Okay. I haven't been recently, but I went a lot when I first got. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That. Yeah. I did. I did. Yeah. It was at Bryn Mawr, I think. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Only like, you know, yeah, nine years ago. <laughs> I know, time flies, yeah. No, this is my 12th year at OSU. Yes. It goes fast. It goes so fast. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. I haven't seen you forever. Wait there. Uh oh. <laughs> Next semester we're offering um, the medieval art class. So, um, awesome. They, we, we didn't have any classes that were required to be here. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 And actually, I'm curious. I'm, so, you know, an intern bar now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Are doing a, a search or um, someone who does art better than I do? <laughs> 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 I teach a gender and visual culture yeah. course that's exactly like that. Yeah, we do yeah. have like, women and gender, and whoever, like, yeah. whoever teaches it just speaks to it. Kind of does it in their, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I really wonder if they just want to know Italian yeah. so maybe we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm going to see you tomorrow, tomorrow night. Yes. Yeah, yes. awesome. Okay.
and the Medieval Renaissance and Reformation Studies program. And I want to encourage you, as you're listening, to write down any questions you have, because I can assure you that nobody except for Dr. Borland knows as much uh, as she does. So no question is a stupid question. So please uh, do have your questions after she talks. So please welcome me, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Borland. Thank you. Um, okay, so I don't have to touch anything. We're on. All right. Um, so yeah, so I want to thank you all for being here today, and also um, thank uh, Dr. Graham. Or Dr. Graham. Sorry, I have another friend named Emily Graham, and Graham comes right after my my brain with Emily. So Dr. Hey, sorry. Um, and also, um, she, Dr. Graham, is a colleague of mine, a medievalist at OSU, and I just <laughs> taught a course with her at Cambridge in the UK, so I've been working a lot with her lately, so I apologize for that. Anyway, um, I, I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you all about Glen Cairn. Um, and yeah, as, as um, Dr. Haig said, I am a medievalist. Um, I usually do work on art of the Middle Ages, so like, uh, roughly 500 to 1500 in Europe, right? Um, but I started getting more and more interested in medievalism. Um, so kind of modern uh, recreations or conceptualizations of the medieval. And so that's really where this, this project kind of comes out of. Um, and I know that you've already been asked, but yes, I was curious how many of you had been to Glen Cairn or at least knew about it or knew roughly where it was. Um, it is about an hour from here if you drive, um, and it is about two hours if you take a different method. Um, at any rate, um, about you know, sort of less than 20 miles from here. So it's a great opportunity um, for all of you to kind of follow up today with today's um, talk and maybe go at some point. They do public tours, and um, it's a really interesting place. Um, I also, also wanted to mention that this comes out of a recent article that I published with a friend named Martha Easton, and she's been working on another revivalist medieval house called Hammond Castle in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Anyone been there? No, that seems, that's less local. Um, and so um, although we've been thinking about these two houses kind of in tandem and and how they think about the medieval or reflect the medieval in different ways. Today, I'm really going to just kind of focus on, um, on talking about Glen Cairn. So, in the former home of Raymond Pitcairn and his wife Mildred, built between 1928 and 1939, and now the Glen Cairn Museum in Bernathen, the lines between medieval and modern are overtly and successfully blurred. Although sometimes described as Romanesque in style, its form is decidedly from the 1930s. Pitcairn originally began collecting medieval art to inspire the artists working on the nearby cathedral, a building overseen by Pitcairn and built between 1913 and 1928 for the new church, a Swedenborgian Christian denomination founded in 1890 in Bernathen. Pitcairn's collecting was made possible by the wealthy, um, by the wealth uh, generated through the family's company, um, which he ran, the Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company, and that's still an existing company um, with huge headquarters in Pittsburgh. Um, and so, you know, even in the in the teens and twenties, this was a very powerful company, but it continues to be so today. This collecting eventually developed into a passion, and in a relatively short period of time, primarily between 1916 and 1928, he collected hundreds of medieval sculptures, stained glass windows, and architectural fragments, and he ultimately amassed one of the largest private collections of medieval art in the United States. Glen Cairn was built to house the artworks and be his family's home right next to the cathedral. Although Bryn Appen Cathedral was built using ostensibly medieval methods and appears to gain, and appears as a genuine attempt at recreation, and so you can kind of see it looks like a very kind of traditional Gothic building. Um, Glen Cairn engages with, with the medieval differently. On one hand, um, we see the influence of the cathedral building in the home's recreated stained glass windows, carved stone, and intricate mosaics. On the other hand, there is a rich collection of medieval artworks 
that are thoroughly integrated into the very modern fabric of the house. So at Glen Cairn, past and present are always colliding. Glen Cairn is one of many early 20th century American homes that were built in this medieval revival style. Medievalism, or the ongoing process of recreating, reinventing, and reenacting medieval culture in post-medieval times, has garnered an increasing amount of, of attention um, by the broader field of medieval studies over the past 30 or so years. And just to kind of put different ways of thinking about the medieval in mind, of course, Monty Python's Holy Grail, medieval times. Is there medieval times near here? There's like 10 in the country, so they never know exactly where they are. There is one nearby. Um, the Cloisters Museum in New York, and even Notre Dame in Paris, which although we think of as a medieval building, has huge amounts of it that were restored in the 19th century, and are really 19th century medievalism more than original medieval material. The sorts of medievalisms prevalent in the 19th and 20th century in America include the popularity of Arthuriana, or stories around King Arthur, um, the anti-industrialization and craftsmanship of the um, aesthetics of the arts and crafts movement, the building of medieval style cathedrals, St. John the Divine in New York, Washington National Cathedral in Washington, DC, um, plenty of other examples, Philly's full of uh, examples of 19th century cathedrals um, in this style. Um, the collecting display of medieval art collections, um, and all of these kind of um, examples of this period's medievalism are often discussed in terms of nostalgia, kind of looking back to the medieval period and to Europe with a kind of um, uh, affection. This interpretation of medievalism, in which America yearns for a past that it doesn't have in its own country, um, for, the for the Middle Ages that once were, um, often makes sense. It is difficult to disagree with the argument that American industrialists who became interested in the medieval, expressed through public commissions or private collecting, were engaged in an aspect of America's growing imperialist power when they were appropriating the Middle Ages for themselves. But I'd argue that there's more to it than that. Other things happen as well when medieval art is acquired, relocated, and displayed in a new medieval or a new American context. Glen Cairn was built in a medieval style that also incorporates actual medieval objects like architectural fragments, stained glass, and sculpture. It resituates the art of the past into the present, reinterpreting, reinterpreting the past, but also reinventing the medieval objects through recontextualization. I argue that the building reinvigorates its medieval objects, engaging viewers with immediacy and directness that is wholly different than how they would have done so in their medieval context. And that as a result, homes like Glen Cairn reorient, <coughs> reorient the usual focus of the origins of medieval art, um, on the origins of medieval art, uh, to prioritize the longer life of surviving medieval objects. I'm interested in thinking about what the word authenticity means in revival, revivalist buildings like Glen Cairn, considering the ways that the past and present work together to make meaning beyond the original moment of creation. How does this building manipulate our expectations and create new and unique experiences of the medieval? So of course, like kind of traditional medieval art history is very concerned with the moment that something was made. And so I'm interested in, in also thinking about the periods after that moment was made and how people engage with these things as they exist over kind of the long lifespan of an object. Raymond Pitcairn was not, was not an architect, but he led the building projects for both Bryn Athen Cathedral and Glen Cairn. The designs for each of these buildings evolved gradually, relying on what he perceived to be more medieval methods of architectural planning and building. So using small scale models and then full size plaster models rather than blueprints. Several workshops were constructed on the cathedral's building site for stone, wood, metal, and glass. Pitcairn was determined to reproduce the textures and pure colors of the early Gothic French windows he admired during his trips to Europe researching for this construction. In order to revive the medieval art of making pot metal glass, he arranged for Arthur Kingsley Porter, who was the professor of art history at Harvard and a noted scholar of medieval art and architecture, to translate Theophilus's 12th century text on the subject. 
Pitcairn's artists were sent to England and France to photograph and draw windows in specific buildings. Stained glass craftsmen were sought and set to work experimenting with color recipes before they moved on to, to create the hand-blown windows seen in the cathedral today. Emblematic of the authenticity with which the Gothic cathedral has been viewed, Porter wrote to Pitcairn, quote, your church alone of modern buildings, in my judgment, is worthy of comparison with the best the Middle Ages produced, end quote. By contrast, the architecture of, of Pitcairn's home um, was, was not a recreation, but a specific um, kind of iteration that reflects his moment in, in the teens and 1920s. It is a quirky combination of medieval-like elements with 1930s mansion design and arts and crafts aesthetics, also seen in homes by contemporary American architects such as Frank Lloyd Wright or the brothers um, Charles Sumner Green and Henry Mather Green, um, such as the Gamble House in Pasadena. The Great Hall, for instance, includes handcrafted elements such as large mosaics, um, including the arch, which is actually here. There's a pointer in there. This um, tall arch right here. Um, bookshelves, doors, balconies, and furniture carved from wood and decorated with patterns, family names, and biblical text. So some of the wood element right here or up here in this balcony. Uh, and enlarged interlaced patterns and Swedenborgian quotations in mosaics decorating the high ceiling. And there we have an image right there. Nevertheless, its decoration exemplified by the Great Hall was still very much informed by the work that he had done next door at the cathedral. Pitcairn saw his house, despite its different style, as a valuable opportunity to keep working um, with the artists in these workshops and to keep those workshops running. Um, to keep those artists employed after the completion of the church. Pitcairn's endeavors, his buildings, as well as his collecting of medieval art, have been treated as serious and intellectual, and thus as more authentic than some other collectors and home builders of this period. Um, before the building of Glencairn was complete, many of Pitcairn's medieval objects were on extended loan in the new medieval galleries at the um, Philadelphia Museum of Art. And in 1982, the Metropolitan Museum of Art launched a large and heavily researched exhibition of objects from his collection called Radiance and Reflection, Medieval Art from the Raymond Pitcairn Collection. Even in the early, earlier years when he was actively building and collecting, Pitcairn forged relationships with experts and scholars like Arthur Kingsley Porter and Fisk Kimball, who was the director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. <coughs> whose involvement with Pitcairn's enterprises implied a certain level of validation. So he kind of created this um, reputation for um, being a very kind of respected uh, collector, partly because he engaged with these very kind of scholarly um, medieval experts. Raymond Pitcairn seems to have actively encouraged this perception of his collecting as selective, refined, and private. The publicity around his famous purchase of Henry Lawrence's large collection of medieval stained glass in 1921 is an example of the way that Pitcairn is often portrayed. A relative unknown on the collecting scene before the sale, he seemingly appeared out of nowhere and significantly outbid people like William Randolph Hearst and other collectors for what was an exorbitant uh, uh, purchase at the time, $153,850 for 23 panels of stained glass. But he did not necessarily differ from his contemporaries in his opportunism, as surviving correspondence between Pitcairn and several dealers suggests that even Pit when Pitcairn, Pitcairn prided himself on his discerning taste and wished to purchase artworks of top quality, he still wanted to make sure that he got them at the most reasonable price possible. Scholars have pointed out that the core of Pitcairn's collection was formed at the only time in the century when acquiring works of quality and specifically of the medieval period was possible. And his successes were at least partly attributable to fortuitous timing 
rather than his unique skills. So especially that window of time between World War I and World War II, um, there was a lot of European medieval art that was on the market and available to um, American collectors. The characterization of Pitcairn as extremely discriminating implies that he was not easily swayed by dealers, but at times he was clearly susceptible to their rhetoric. For example, in 1922, Pitcairn purchased a 13th century sculpture of St. Paul from the dealer René Gimple. Gimple describes it as, quote, one of the finest specimens of French art, School of the Isle of France, 13th century. That is, um, that it has retained its original polychromy um, and that no modern part, whatever, has been added thereon. So making an argument that this was a really unique opportunity, right? Um, Pitcairn eventually paid $110,000 for the sculpture, which was treated as medieval in the catalog for the 1982 exhibition at the Met. Since then, scholars have expressed doubt about this sculpture, suggesting that it was actually carved by a 19th century artist who was working under um, Boilet-le-Duc's restoration of various buildings in Paris, including Saint-Chapelle, another um, uh, structure in Paris, um, that uh, suggests that you know, we have 19th century artists who are very much trying to um, create an aesthetic of the 13th century. Such instances of dubious or unknown origin are understandably underemphasized in the museum's current minimalist wall labels, which rarely reflect the questions about provenance that you might encounter in some of the object files. So essentially, when you go to Glen Cairn and you walk through the Great Hall, you don't necessarily get this information, right? Um, in thinking about the different sorts of authenticities on display at Glen Cairn, it is clear that the concept of authenticity itself is a problematic one. Nothing can really be authentically medieval if it exists in the modern world. Glencairn, as an early 20th century home, was made up of thousands of parts, some of which were from other historical periods, but many of which were contemporary. Pitcairn creatively played with the juxtapositions of new and old, past and present, as well as intentionally subverting the distinctions between what was actually old and what was made to look old. The conflation of historical periods leads the reproduction itself to seem authentic, particularly in such places that make no particular attempt to distinguish between the original and a facsimile. The combination of the authentic and inauthentic creates not a copy, not a simulacrum, but something that transcends time and space, that through the destruction of its original cultural context creates a new, equally rich one. The Great Hall of Glencairn is made up of almost an infinite array of objects and materials. There are around 50 medieval artworks grouped into conglomerations that are embedded into the walls or placed in specific positions for display, with more medieval capitals resting atop bookshelves and figurative sculptures poised on the balcony railing. There is an abundance of stained glass incorporated into the walls, including fragments of medieval stained glass purchased by Pitcairn, modern replicas of medieval glass created by the artists working for him, and then all new window designs created for Glen Cairn. So there's kind of these different iterations of engagement with the medieval that are all um, kind of visible at the same time. In addition, throughout the large hall are medieval inspired elements that are not replicas, but channel the medieval through that arts and crafts aesthetic. The huge mosaic arch, the carved stone columns and capitals, hand-hewn wood elements like bookshelves, doors, and furniture, um, many of which are often painted with sort of medievalist designs. The highlight, or one of the highlights, um, I really like this aspect of it, is the handmade medievalesque decoration on the high ceiling, the beams of which are encrusted with dazzling glass mosaics that enlarge the famously complicated interlace patterns of the early medieval manuscript known as the Book of Kells. In this rich and complex context, several groupings of medieval objects are created out of freestanding artworks arranged in front of architectural remnants built into the walls. Um, so, you know, in this particular instance, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, um, we have, you know, sort of this engagement with a medieval <coughs> object, but then the medium and the scale are completely transformed. In just one of these conglomerations of fragments, we have. See, I'm going to walk over here a little point a little bit. Oops, that's not the pointer. Here we go. 
Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about this conglomeration right here. We've got that 13th or 19th century sculpture of St. Paul, which stands on a 12th century capital from France of a seated Christ flanked by lions. Above and set into the walls, an 11th century tympanum um, thought to be from Italy. To the right is a 12th century capital of Christ baptism. And to the left is a polychrome wooden virgin and child. It sits atop a capital column and base attributed um, to the 12th century cloister at Saint Michel de Cuxa um, in France. Above St. Paul, there are also several 12th century heads from France, up here, and a um, possibly 12th century Italian relief of St. Daria with a lion, although this has also been kind of put into question in terms of its date. So across the hall, over here, we have another one of those sort of groupings, um, a mid-12th century statue column of a queen. Um, from France is positioned in an equally complex grouping of objects from different places and periods and framed by a now thought to be modern doorway um, or archway. Not unlike the decontextualized way such objects are often displayed in museums today, these objects and architectural remnants at Glencairn are presented so that their original purposes or contexts are obscured. Perhaps when we, are, when we visit museums, we are right to expect to be informed of this lost context. You might look for a wall label or other information that tells you about where this thing came from. But in someone's home, that expectation needs to be kept in check because this integration, while yes, obscuring that past, also offers us another way to understand the lives of these objects. Grouped aesthetically rather than historically, objects from different places and times have been combined into new configurations. In each conglomeration at Glencairn, relationships are established between previously unrelated pieces, spotlighting these surviving fragments over the lost holes from which they came, and creating, creating unexpected dialogues between multiple pasts and presents that were never intended or imagined when these artworks were created. In the 20th century appropriation of a romanticized lost Middle Ages and the procurement of its displaced architectural rem remains by a wealthy class of private collectors, there seems to be a search for atmospheric and authentic experience in the face of tremendous social and technological change. If we think about things happening in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Scholars Dale Kinney and Richard Brilliant have discussed the phenomenon of spoliation. That is, when objects from one culture or time period are reused in another. The fragments collected by Pitcairn and installed in his home function like spolia, and, their, and in their new environments provide an aura of a past time as they contribute to the construction of the present. But whether or not these, new, these, whether or not these collectors knew the origins of a particular fragment or not. Um, the act of reappropriation itself is inherently tied to this type of violence. In Kinney's words, quote, spoliation entails a forcible transfer of ownership. Spolia are survivors of violence, end quote. So there's a, a set of kind of ethical and moral issues associated with spolia um, and raised by these kind of modern um, instances of spoliation. And that stems in part from the fact that Spoliation inevitably destroys the original context, right? Even taking into consideration that some of those original contexts may have already been partly destroyed. And certainly a fair number of the things that collectors were acquiring in the early 20th century um, were already in kind of ruined buildings. So it's not necessarily the case that Pitcairn's literally walking up to a, a standing structure and, and pulling pieces off of it but rather that um, the dealers working out of Europe were very much um, making, uh, taking advantage of a lot of these um, kind of um, abandoned structures. Glencairn, like many other medievalist homes and buildings of the period, reflects an imperialist American attitude toward the non-American past and its material remains. The acquisitions of fragments by wealthy industrialist collectors, um, fragments, Fragments that were created in the, um, often created in the destruction of World War I, 
suggests a peculiar um, American concern with that dislocated past. And there's a lot of scholarship out there that explores um, kind of American investment in um, the ruined buildings between, especially that are kind of the result of World War I. All of these collecting industrialists, so Raymond Pitcairn, John J. Um, Hammond Jr., J.P. Morgan, William Randolph Hearst, took advantage of the lack of strict export controls in this period that followed World War I, especially in France, until about 1928. In an image of um, J.P. Morgan, um, titled The Magnet, um, from Puck Magazine um, in 1911, um, seems to illustrate the great compulsion to acquire such fragments. So here we have him holding um, a giant magnet um, in a dollar sign and all of the different kinds of objects that he's collecting from Europe and bringing over to the US. Now, if any of you have been to the Morgan Library um, in, Was in Washington, in New York, um, you'll certainly see some of his collection. And a lot of his collection also ended up in the, in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, but I, I, I do love the, the kind of the critique of this cartoon. Indeed, each and every spoliated fragment speaks to its forceful relocation, damaged original source, and potentially de denied past, which greater geographic distance can exacerbate further. At Glencairn, authentic medieval objects exist alongside replicas, but that difference is rarely made clear to visitors. All these things are also housed in a medievalizing context that audiences may not realize is not fully that that audiences may not realize is fully modern. Rather than interpret this as intentionally misleading, um, however, such conflation provides the opportunity for thinking about the more provocative implications of this kind of historical ambiguity. Glenn Cairn integrates past and present with a mix of medieval and modern architectural styles and object collections ultimately transcending both time periods to create a new historical reality. Glencairn now displays modern stained glass windows, original medieval glass from Pitcairn's collection, and modern replicas of medieval windows, specifically of Chart Cathedral in France. Furthermore, the glass tesserae in the mosaics, um, which exist throughout the house, but we see in the Great Hall, especially in that large arch and in the ceiling, were produced in the same shops that made the cathedral's stained glass windows even though the um, mosaics are clearly not an attempt to be either authentic or based on medieval models. The Book of Kells ceiling mosaics are particularly complicated as recreations. They engage with the medieval on multiple levels, but result in a uniquely unmedieval outcome. Pitcairn's decision to take materials made in a medieval fashion through both the historically informed techniques used for the production of the glass and the choice itself of mosaic as an architectural decoration. Um, not that you would necessarily see a lot of um, glass mosaic in a Gothic cathedral, but you would definitely see it in other kinds of medieval buildings, um, especially uh, Byzantine um, architecture. Um, and then apply that form to a design based on another medieval source of a radically different scale and medium is a peculiar one. This jumbling together of multiple media reinforces the imaginary fabricated nature of the medieval at Glencairn. But the creative refashioning evident in the building also reinstates the flexibility of the medieval and the intangibility of historical accuracy or the original life of medieval things. Is the confusion created by these conflations intentional or just a side effect of our expectations? Perhaps confusion only occurs if you are looking for a distinction between medieval and not medieval. Since with so many of the objects in this collection, a complete sense of their origins is indeed lost, or you know, if it was a later recreation, never really existed at all. The impossibility of that recovery seems to come into direct conflict with their assertive presence today. So many artworks, buildings, and objects from the past have been lost or destroyed that the simple survival of these pieces that we have access to today, including those on display at Glencairn, is rather significant. Their presence is pushy, belligerent, and powerful. And this persistence make it, makes it arguably less important whether a particular sculpture was from this building or that one or stood next to that saint or this one. Um, 
Do the often inaccessible origins of an object really matter as much as we have assumed? Or can we allow medievalist projects like this building to release us of those expectations? Are there equally important or more interesting things to be gleaned from extant objects when we no longer prioritize a somewhat idealized past over the many other moments, including the contemporary one in that object's life? The differences between past and present are not always clear. In the Great Hall at Glen Cairn, visitors experience groupings of objects which have come together in, very, in a very different location in Brynafen. They are not just displayed alongside each other, but are actively recontextualized within a new but still medievalized context. And they are configured with a bold assertion that this is how they should be, will be, seen now. In fact, at some point, it can be difficult to imagine these fragments in any other situation especially those in the distant and inaccessible past. It becomes a challenge to imagine the St. Paul sculpture not under that tympanum, or that queen column not at the center of that particular doorway. A complex network of objects is created within these installations, which construct new relationships between these previously unrelated pieces. Furthermore, in this form of display, specific objects are brought into focus in a way wholly different from their original context. How closely would any of us have looked at St. Paul if he was really on um, the transept door of Notre Dame, a secondary entrance that most of today's visitors to Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris uh, probably don't even visit, and alongside dozens of other figures and, and sculptural decoration. Or even if he was part of a building like um, Saint Chapelle added in the 19th century. We still may not um, pay attention to him in the way that we do here. The aesthetic logic of the arrangements made at Glencairn presents us with an entirely new, thoroughly modern, and yet fully engaging experience of these fragments in dialogue with one another and with the building as a whole. The integration that we see at Glencairn does not indeed, does not, does indeed, sorry, does indeed obscure the past but it also offers us alternatives for understanding the lives of these objects. In the Great Hall, they do not seem to be relics of a lost past, preserved but isolated symbols. On the, contrary, on the contrary, in these complex contexts, these fragments take on new and richly evocative meanings. They communicate the personal passion um, that, that Pickern had for medieval art, but more than that, they offer a way to reconsider the lives of such objects. With the passage of time, these buildings themselves are now historic artifacts that tell us something about how people in the 1920s and 1930s collected, displayed, and envisioned the medieval. Perhaps more than any other historical period, the Middle Ages has inspired later generations not only to try to understand it, but also in many ways to relive it. But rather than seeing the scholarly enterprise as somehow more worthy or rigorous than the popular appropriation, I would argue that both ways of seeing the Middle Ages are valid, and ultimately both are recreations of a period that is fundamentally unknowable except through our own reconstructions of it. Glencairn creates collective memories of a constructed history and makes new meanings for the medieval that are no less significant than any that have come before. Thank you. All right, and we have a lot of time for questions, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question and then a, and then a possible suggestion on the source. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the question, the Sweden, I only know a little bit about the Sweden Borgian uh, faith. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if, the, if, if this interest in the Middle Ages and medieval art was specific to Pitcairn. It seems like you know, the detail is going on, or if it's something embedded in Sweden Borgian. You know, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I think with my work, I've been sort of making the argument against the uniqueness of that because it's happening by so many other kind of collectors at the same time. But if you go to Glencairn, and I do think this is the other side of that, um, they definitely see that there's an argument there for, and I think often when he was collecting, he made the argument that it was um, connected to um, their belief system um, in which there's a kind of sense that the... Um, Kind of in the relationship between humankind and God um, happens differently in these different epochs. And so they have a great respect for ancient Greece, for Islam, for um, 
other periods, different periods of Christianity. And, and so the um, collecting that they now display at the museum, of course, isn't just medieval art. You know, they have collections of, of classical art, um, Egyptian art, Jewish art, et cetera. And so there is a, an interesting um, uh, openness to other religions and other cultures um, that is reflected when you, when you go to visit today. And so I definitely think that a certain kind of um, uh, understanding of, of God's relationship to humankind is reflected in this collection. Um, but I don't think it's particular to just medieval. I think that just ended up being um, kind of the, the period that really captured Raymond Pickern's interest more than some of the others. But I know there were additionally people, maybe his father and some uncles who were also collecting at the same time to, to build a collection that um, and it would reflect this broader understanding of kind of um, human religion. So I think that's, I do think that that's part of what you see when you go there today. And, um, and they have a number of galleries that um, show the art of those other periods and cultures. So I'm really focused on the Great Hall where it is mostly medieval, but I think that there is this kind of broader, really interesting engagement today with this kind of openness of thinking about how, how religion has been um, kind of expressed by, by humankind over time. The source I was going to suggest, I don't know if you've seen it, is um, Alexander Walsham's article, Recycling the Sacred in Church History. I mean, it's, it's about the Reformation. Okay. So it, it might provide a, yeah. you know, some kind of theoretical approach. And it's about how objects were recycled in the Reformation, medieval objects and sacred objects. Yeah. Um, and it's in church history. Okay, thank you. It's a great article. And yeah. Doing more work on that. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I sort of talked about the, the um, notion of spoliation in a somewhat negative way to make a point. But I think that the reuse of objects from one culture into another is a really common thing that we see throughout history. We see all sorts of instances in the Middle Ages of building parts being reused that were classical, um, Greek or Roman or something else, right? And so often that's. Um, that's, you know, there's, there's other ways that you can read that, right? You can read it just as a practical, you know, this column has already been cut, why would I not reuse it? Um, but also often that cultural absorption is a way to um, kind of make the new culture more palatable, maybe to people who have a historical memory of that older culture. Um, so incorporating it into a, con a kind of new iteration like a reform, a reformation building um, would facilitate potentially um, uh, helping, helping people kind of adjust to that, that change, right? Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting moments in history where you can point to the reuse of older objects as a, you know, um, either a, a kind of um, practical or ideological tool. So um, there's, yeah, there's some, a lot of really interesting kind of comparative examples like that. Yeah. Certainly, take more of an interest in medievalism. It's getting popular, like you said, a lot of like King Arthur stories are becoming popular. What is it during that time that sort of spiked that interest, or what do you think was going on in America at the time? Yeah, the yeah. Um, well, I have a lot of ideas, but does anyone else in here have any thoughts? Do you know anything about the 19th century that that might seem to make you know sort of sense in terms of like why people might kind of shift towards this nostalgia with the past? <laughs> I think it's things like the Industrial Revolution, right? I mean, I think that there's part of it, and I, and I think that's often the story that you get with like the arts and crafts movement and this interest in making things by hand and you know, hand carving. And you know, I love that we're in this, this room right here. And you know, when you guys leave this classroom, you have all sorts of great examples of that throughout, you know, um, throughout your campus. Um, but this kind of idea that with industrialization, the, the kind of individual is, is kind of absent. And this um, shift kind of in the late 19th um, and early 20th centuries, I think in the US it happens more in the, in the early 20th century, but um, definitely kind of um, medievalism and um, kind of interesting craft and, and handmade things is taking place in the 19th century in like England and other parts of, of Europe too. But this, yeah, I think this, um, I mean, it's, you know, we can 
compare it to something like today with the popularity of like knitting and Etsy, you know, this kind of argument that when everything's made in China, you also find it very compelling to have something that someone made by hand and, and made for you, right? And so I think there is this kind of constant back and forth over the last couple of centuries about like, it's, you know, industrialized things are, are great and then there's kind of this backlash to that. Um, in terms of the actual, why European medieval and not, you know, kind of other historical periods, I mean, I think that a lot of, um, Arguments have been made for, um, you know, the sort of the leaders of American culture in the 19th and 20th century, whether we're talking about people like these industrialists who are the wealthy, you know, classes. This is the kind of gilded age when, when um, these individuals have a huge amount of kind of cultural power. They're often philanthropists and also the ones who are funding the building of things. Another example of this might be like Carnegie. Um, or Carnegie and his, his funding of libraries um, and his belief um, that he published about that, um, that the wealthy knew best how to spend money to help people who were less wealthy. And so this kind of philanthropical um, attitude carried over during World War I and World War II, where there was a perception that the Americans um, were, were going over to help uh, Europeans who, who couldn't manage their situation on their own, this almost kind of paternalistic approach, right? And then, um, for instance, Rockefeller was one of the people who raised money to restore Reims Cathedral after it was destroyed in World War I. And so there was a huge movement in the US to help raise money to um, rebuild medieval buildings in Europe that had been destroyed. And so there was a lot of this sort of um, idea that um, you know, if, if the um, medieval treasures of Europe couldn't be maintained by Europeans, then the Americans could help, whether either that meant funding restoration or, of course, taking things back here where we can take care of them better. I mean, it's that same message that you get for a lot of other kinds of um, colonialist enterprises, right? And I think in some ways you can make parallels with broader colonial um, art appropriation. Um, and then I just think that there was a perception that Europe had this great long history and that, you know, um, the United States as a political entity or, a, you know, a, a, an actual country was somewhat young and didn't have that long historical legacy. And so going back to the medieval, I mean, you know, not just at your campus or other, you know, few campuses. I mean, the collegiate Gothic is a huge phenomenon. So there's also you know, all those buildings are being built kind of in the 19th and early 20th century. This perception that um, kind of knowledge and um, kind of intellectual rigor and historical understanding were tied to this aesthetic. And so pulling it from Europe helped kind of generate a feeling that that existed here even when it, when it didn't, right? Um, so I think there's a lot of different pieces of where that's coming from. But all of these things are kind of folded up into one another. Yeah? I was just going to say, too, in a larger context, right? If you think of 19th century Europe, you're also seeing a lot of that, right? You've got Victor Hugo, who wrote French romantic, they're totally rediscovering the Middle Ages and putting their own spin on it, and the same in England. So I mm -hmm. think you've got people traveling late 19th century into the 20th century, and they're also taking that with them when they're coming back to Europe. Absolutely, yeah. And also, I guess, you know, after World War One, there must have been a tremendous sense of nostalgia for the unified Western civilization prior to the Reformation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. It was destroyed by World War I. Was Absolutely. Yeah. It's fascinating material, and I just taught my American art class, and it's just bringing up all these questions about American identity and all of that kind of thing. The thing that also grabbed me is um, this idea of jumbling together all of these different materials from different contexts, and there's, there's something very medieval about it, this irreverence about it, and um, <laughs> And disregard for continuity and context that I, that I love as a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also taken by the idea that you know, that's going on and then these things are arrested and put in space, you know, put in place forever. Like you say, you can't hardly imagine that sculpture without being on top of that column you know, right. and that kind of thing. And, um, and it reminds me of the barns. <laughs> and yeah. All things um, were collected from many different places and put together in this unusual configuration. Mm -hmm. and cannot move, at least not yet. Right. Um, 
and how they are. I mean, I, I tend to think of them as being trapped, frankly. Right. Um, because we'll never see all the card players together. We'll never see you know the models next to you, know, et cetera. Um, so I'm just curious if I'm sure that you did look at collections in houses and collector uh, practices. And I'm wondering how fruitful that was and if it shed any light on what was specific about medieval art and medievalism or, or not. Yeah, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I can't remember. Was the original Barnes Foundation his house first, or was it always no, a public it was always a or a museum? museum? His house was connected. Connected. Yeah. Okay. You did um, have his house, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. I, I do think there's something kind of a little bit different about perceiving a collection as yours in your family's house versus constructed for consumption of others. In fact, um, and the, so there's a few things. One is that there's a huge body of artworks in their collection that isn't in the, the Great Hall, right? So this is kind of a small por percentage of his bigger collection, which you know has been displayed in a lot of different places, has gone to the PMA. Um, there's some other galleries attached to this space that you know things are moved and put in and out and that kind of thing. So I think this group is kind of locked in, but but there's other pieces of the collection that are a little bit more flexible. Um, but I think. You know, when he was um, constructing this building, he was, and, and then once it was ostensibly finished and the family had moved in, there was a sense that you had to get kind of personal permission to see it. It wasn't a space that was open to the public. Um, I'm not going to remember the dates that they died, but his wife died after him in like the late 70s. And that's when it turned over into a museum and public could finally come. So it kind of lines up with the same moment that they had that Met exhibition. Um, so there seems in that case that, that once the original family wasn't living in the space anymore, they had decided that it would be OK to open it up and treat it more like a museum than a personal house. Um, and I think there's a lot of cases. In the case of Hammond Castle, um, uh, John J. Hammond Jr.'s <laughs> house. He always envisioned it as a museum, even though it was his house. And he invited, like, he sold tickets to come in, um, uh, like, right out, right off the bat, like, as soon as it was done. And, you know, um, and so he had a very different kind of approach. So I think a lot of it has to do with, like, how, how these collectors view their relationship to their home. As a, as a space and, and what it meant, is meant to do for them individually and those that think about their spaces as somewhat public displays of their wealth or inventiveness or what have you. Um, Hammond was also an inventor and had all these kind of crazy things. He, could, he had a, ha, like a courtyard inside his house that he could make it rain. You know, like there was like all sorts of inventions he was doing. So there's like, you know, a different um, way in which these spaces, I think, were, were conceived by their builders. Um, but, but in the case of Pitcairn, they seem to have been very clear that this was a house for the family. And so you, know, you can take a tour of the, some of the other rooms, um, different rooms of different children. They had eight or nine children. Um, and there's lots of iconography throughout the house of all the children. There's like you know, two two adult sheep and a whole bunch of lambs, or you know, they'll use this kind of these motifs to reflect the family. And so I think that even with the the um, the collection being part of it, it was always seen as this like personal space. And I yeah, I don't know if that quite gets at your yeah, no, question. It just but raises more interesting questions, which is you know, yeah. how much of our home is a public display right. and private. Absolutely. And you know, I mean he started this house after the cathedral was built, and there, there are kind of there's evidence in the um, in the letters and, and correspondence that survive that at some point his wife was like, "We're done. Stop messing with this building. I'm ready to move into this house. We like, you know, decided we were going to build like 15 years ago, and you're still like futzing with the, you know, the mosaics in this window or in this room or whatever." Um, he was really like in the um, one of my favorite kind of series of exchanges in the in the archives, 
So these blue tiles are not glass, but are you know like ceramic tiles that he ordered from a specific vendor. He um, picked like 11 different colors of blue that were going to be, so you can see they're, they're not all the same color. They're a little bit different. And he got samples, and he didn't like them all. So like he's, he's picking an array of blues, and he didn't like some of the blues, and sent them back, and had them like tweak this one a little bit, send it back to me. I mean, he was so obsessive about every little piece of this building. And some of it's really quite forward looking. There's a large tower where he has an elevator and it was, um, you know, the kind of, it has a concrete kind of interior that was really kind of um, innovative uh, in terms of kind of structural engineering at the time. Um, but he's, he's literally working with the artists and designers on, on every little nook and cranny of this space. Um, and yeah, it, it could have taken another, you know, 50 years. He just would have kept fiddling, right? And, and there's a point at which he's, his wife is like, we're just moving in, because um, I'm, I'm done waiting for this house. Um, and, you know, so, so yeah, so I think that the collection is a part of that, but it, he's also seeing it as a piece of this much more complicated thing, right? Um, yeah, so. But, but in terms of the public, private, so I didn't quite touch on that. So, so this idea, I think, that he was, he was making his kind of perfect home for himself, surely it also was a public display. I mean, but I think the public display was on some level the exterior, and then the interior was really only accessible to, you know, no friends and and certainly you know they they had parties and people came and saw it um, but it I think it definitely there was a, a perception that it was this um, this intimate space tailored to his family's needs and interests and you know if some people got to see it that's that's great he's also really interested in in um, music and often had um, you know uh, different um, kind of very uh, nationally renowned musicians come and play. Um, and so the acoustics of the Great Hall are also like were thought about in terms of how music is played there. And they still often have a lot of musical performances and things there too. So there was a lot of different kind of pieces to this uh, you know, construction. Um, but I do think that he was, he, I, think, I think that he thought he was really building it you know, kind of this perfect thing for himself and, and his family. Um, as much as that was, I think you're right, still a public, a public thing, but not a totally public thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I thought of the barns too, and I thought, you know, because barns was so, it was such a conscious effort at grouping. Right. And I wondered with the conglomerations here, it, do we have any sort of evidence of why he would have picked these things together? Very different for the, some are medieval and some are not. Right. Yeah. I think actually that's why he picked these and and kind of organized them in the way that he did is a question I haven't gotten to answer, but it's sort of the next whenever I come back to this, that's the next question. They have um, they don't necessarily have records that explicitly answer that question, um, but they do have some of the old models. The, the like small scale models of the building. They have old drawings of, you know, kind of fa the facades of different walls in the um, Great Hall. And I am kind of curious, like at what point, there's, there's some letters where he's talking with say someone at the PMA that currently has something that's on loan there. Oh, I'm gonna need that, you know, tympanum back because it's gonna go into the wall of the building. So trying, I have been interested in sort of trying to figure out was the, was the structure of the building there before he decided which pieces went in, or did he actually have the pieces in mind when he was structuring the, the kind of layout of the interior? And I don't quite know that answer yet. Um, I suspect that some of these things just made sense in relation to one another, and then some of these were like the pieces that he was especially fond of. Um, the, um, the column clean over here, um, Shoot, shoot, sorry, sorry. I knew that was going to happen at one time. I apologize. Um, 
was in their former house as well, and there's like pictures of the family kind of like standing next to her. And they, his wife often describes her as like a, a family member. Like she was, she was a, um, a mainstay of their house for so long. And so there's no, I think there's no question that she would end up in this space because they really, they felt this kind of, um, you know, very close familial relationship with her. So that may be the case with some of the other examples of the works that were just things that, that he or the family really liked and wanted to see more of. Um, but I also think that, you know, they were structuring this in a way where, you know, they could create these, these um, opportunities to incorporate, you know, either a, a new capital or use one of the older ones that they have. Um, and so there are places with modern capitals as well, with like, you know, this, these iconographies of the sheep or some of the other motifs that they use throughout the house to kind of reference the family. Um, or they could use one of the medieval pieces that they had. And so, you know, I think designing it in a way that there were opportunities, so we have, you know, all these little pillars where they could put a sculpture that was medieval, you know, and so, and there's another one right there. So that, you know, there were, I think, no question that they were going to, um, create, you know, kind of arches and doorways and columns and, and, um, places for these things to go. And then maybe at that point they decided which one was going to go where because of, you know, kind of scale or issues of relationship between different pieces. But yeah, I'm still sort of figuring out those questions. I think there is, there is some, some more research to be done to kind of think through that a little bit more. That's interesting about the queen being claimed as family. It reminds yeah. me of these sort of family memorials, in, you know, in, in chapels or whatever, where you've got a relief or a bust of a, of yeah. Ownership. I think, I think, of. yes. I mean, she, because she becomes this kind of figure mm -hmm. to them, um, I think she's definitely seen, you know, as a sort of like, we've, we've co-opted her into our family, even though she has nothing to do with our family history. So I think it's a really interesting, um, yeah, thing to, to, to think about, you know, what were, what was, the, and this is another thing that's, that's totally inaccessible at this point, I think, because most of it was driven by him. Um, he was the one communicating with all of the vendors who, and artists and, and craftsmen who were working on the house, um, the builders. But um, I am really curious about her, ex his wife's experience of these spaces. What was she on, um, having kind of a different experience? Was the ch were the children having a different experience? You know, like how, how did this space feel to them? And I think the, 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 there are records of, of the children in their later life talking about growing up in this space and how it was you know, kind of magical and all that kind of stuff. But I wonder if there's more kind of specific ideas about like what did it mean to be surrounded by these things that had come from other places and what were your associations <laughs> with them? And it, I suspect that some of that is, you know, just not available anymore to, to um, access. But it's, it's, it's fun to think about, like, how he had a very almost kind of academic way of thinking about these things. And, and, it's, and when there is a, a reference to her experience of sculptures or other parts of the, of the building, it seems like a much more um, kind of intimate and yeah, just a, a, a different way of, of associating. I don't think she cared where they were from or, or what their date was or any of those kinds of things. And, you know, I mean, his concern about that is, is maybe, um, you know, not as strong as we might be inclined to, to argue. But I think that, I think that there's um, a different way that these different household members would have kind of been engaging with the space. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. And I encourage you all, there's some refreshments outside if you'd like to have some coffee and some tea. Um, thank you again. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you for coming. <laughs>